it was a headline driven week, right? Uh, no one, though, made more or bigger headlines than my next guest. Jeff Gunlock, also known, of course, as the Bond King, released his biggest webcast of the year, uh, much anticipated Just Markets. And by the way, the subtitle, What's Going On? Joining me now, Double Line CEO and CIO Jeff Gunlock. Jeffrey, thanks so much for joining. Hey, Charles. Good to be with you again. Hey, be before, we, before we dive into all of the news that you made, I just want to get your, uh, your uh, want to say thank you for being part of the Double Line Roundtable uh, Prime. Uh, and, and, and I want to invite everyone who's watching right now to go to your site, listen to all three parts. By the way, I know you guys are posting the uh, best picks. My pick is through the roof already, so let's get that thing up there. Folks, go to DoubleLine.com. Okay, we got the promo out of the way. This morning we got that CPI report. It was in line. Uh, we have, uh, I think, four Fed speakers. You made a point, and this is, I think, maybe the thing that rose to the top of everything you had to say. Listen to the bond market rather than the Fed when it comes to rates. Why? Well, all you have to do is look at a chart of the Fed funds rate overlaid on top of the two-year Treasury yield. And going back nearly 25 years, every single Fed move has been presaged by an earlier move in the two-year Treasury. Just think about a year ago when the two-year Treasury was up at around one and a half around the Super Bowl last year, and the Fed was dragging their feet on raising rates. And lo and behold, they had to do 475s in a row to catch up with the two-year, but now the two-year yield has been falling and the two-year yield is below the Fed funds rate. In, in fact, every bond yield in the treasury market is below the Fed funds rate. And right now the two-year treasury is at 413 and the high end of the Fed funds rate is 450. So uh, I think if the, if the two-year treasury drops below 4% and it could happen any day now with the way it's moving, I mean, yeah. it's moved already uh, 30 basis points year to date so we're already three quarters of the way to that sort of below 4%. I think you're gonna see a radical shift in Fed rhetoric because the two year treasury is always, people should really look at this overlay chart. I have it on the webcast okay. uh, that's gonna be up on replay, the Just Markets webcast. It's remarkable how you don't really need the Fed and their 800 PhD economists. All you need <laughs> is, the, is a Bloomberg terminal or, or you know, a screen and uh, look at the two-year treasury. Plus, there's so many recession indicators that are now flagging. Uh, the leading economic indicators is always very important. It's very negative. It's more negative on a three-month annualized basis than it is over year over year. It's, it's negative 7.3 annualized. You know, you've got money supply growth. M2 is non-existent yeah. over the past 12 months. You've got ISM orders, ISM PMIs that are, are tanking. Uh, you've got the housing market, which obviously is very slow. So yeah. the Fed just needs to needs to uh, get in line with the bond market. So uh, you, you just referenced the, all the PhDs. They have more PhDs than any any uh, government agency combined, just about right. Uh, I mean, they've got all of this brain power. Uh, they see what you see, obviously. Uh, they see what other people see, obviously. Uh, so what I'm concerned about then is maybe this notion of credibility, maybe this notion of ego, right? I mean, Jay Powell. To me, it seems like he's trying to please the purists, right? He wants to carve out this place in the Financial Hall of Fame, but it will be at the uh, cost of excessive Main Street suffering. This is what I, my main concern with the Fed right now, Jeff. Well, I will give Powell some credit. I think his framework is that if you have inflation that really takes hold, the ultimate consequence of entrenched inflation and uh, elevated inflation expectations leading to a really intractable problem might be worse than a moderate recession. And I think that's his framework that he's thinking of. Uh, but yes, raising the interest rates is going to cause pain. He said so, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, he wants, he doesn't want the long-term inflation problem. I think, I, I really think he should stop worrying so much about the inflation problem at this point though, right? because uh, inflation's coming down, and it's going to come down further for sure uh, in the next few months. It was at 9.1, now it's at 6.5, and, and I think it's going down maybe into the high threes by the middle of this year. The question really is what happens beyond then. So it's, it's picking up speed to the downside, and to all, all those uh, anecdotal uh, points that you just made, they all suggest that it's going to start to come down very, very quick. So I'm listening to the, to the webcast, and a, and a new acronym popped in my head. I'm not sure if you meant to do it, but ABUS. Uh, anything but the United States, anything but the U.S. <laughs> so, so what's up with ABUS? What's wrong with the good old U.S. when it comes USA when it comes to investing right now? Well, I think the dollar is going down, 
and uh, it's already started. I mean, the dollar index DXY was up at 116 several months ago, and now it's below 103, I think. I did, haven't checked it in the last couple hours. And uh, basically, the Fed is going to be incrementally uh, easier than other central banks, just as they were incrementally uh, tougher during 2022. And that's why the dollar went up quite a lot for the first several months of the year. But now uh, they're going, they're, they're over tightened, I think, and they're going to be easing and the dollar is going to go down. And that creates a tailwind for dollar based investors in foreign markets. And the U.S. market outperformed by a humongous amount over the past 10 years prior to 2022 and uh, became very overvalued right. versus its own historical valuations and very overvalued on things like Dr. Schiller's CAPE ratio, really more than double the valuation of emerging what, markets, for example. Right. So what, what, what's emerging markets then are, is it you just buy maybe uh, an ETF? Are there parts of the world, for instance, China with the reopening that might actually even exceed the, the general growth of emerging markets? Um, I really just like a broad basket of emerging markets. Typically, I don't like China because as a U.S. Uh, investor, the tensions between the U.S. and China keep escalating. And I worry that if something really goes bad, you know, you might not be able to uh, get your money out. So uh, I worry about that. But I do think China, you know, the reopening will be incrementally positive. So for the short term, uh, I would not be afraid of China. But I think South America, I think India and Southeast Asia primarily, though. India is my number one pick long term. Yeah. I just think demographically, India is exactly where China was 35 years ago. And we've seen what happened to the relative economy of China versus the United States. And I think India is going to be in that same position. And yeah. they have fantastic demographics. So I would buy that one and hold on to it. I wouldn't even open my statement for five years, lest you get fearful when it drops 25% in a quarter, because I think this is a long term. This is an investment for your, your, your grandchildren's college education. I, I love that you said that India, the world's largest democracy, a young nation, uh, it's, it's on the upswing. The other area you made really big news is, uh, you know, a lot of folks have given up on the 60-40 portfolio, 60% 60 stocks, 40% bonds. It was the gold standard for years, particularly in retirement accounts. You say no, go with the 40-60 portfolio now? Yes. Uh, one year ago, stocks were massively overvalued versus their own historical valuations, but they were cheap to bonds, unbelievably. Cheap to the 10-year Treasury because the 10-year Treasury yield was down at 1%. But thanks to interest rates going up and the Fed raising, you know, interest rates 425 basis points and credit spreads on high yield bonds, corporate bonds, emerging market bonds, asset backed securities all widening out. You now have bonds are very cheap to stocks. Right. And you have tremendous income now available from a mix of bonds that say maybe pretty easy without a high risk context to get seven or eight percent from a mix of Treasury bonds and some of this credit that has uh, gone up so much in yield. And thanks to the fact that Treasury yields rose, you actually have profit potential on the Treasury market. Uh, it's already happened, unfortunately, in a, to a certain extent. I mean, the 10-year Treasury yield is down 70 basis points from its peak. Even the, even the two-year Treasury yield is down 60 basis points from where it was a few months ago. Yeah. Obviously, not, you know, taunting the Fed with their hawkish rhetoric. But the bond mix is really attractive. One thing, Charles, people have to understand about bonds is it's really important what your price cost is on bonds. One year ago, a bond portfolio would have been at a price above 100. And you get paid back at maturity at, at 100 cents on the dollar. So you don't have any real enduring profit potential from a bond portfolio purchased at or above 100 cents. But thanks to the interest rate increases, bond portfolios are down in the 80s or even in the 70s wow. to in parts of the credit market. Right. And it's very easy for bonds priced at 75 to go up to 85 or 95. That sounds like the profit potential from the stock market. That's huge. It's a good case. Jeff, and then you have four times the income flow and less downside. So bonds are really cheap compared to stocks, although less so now that they've started sure, to really the, the, the yields are coming down pretty quickly. Jeff, hold right there. We're going to be right back with, uh, with more with you. We're going to need to take a quick break. But Welcome back. We're here with Double Line CEO and CIO Jeffrey Gunlock. And Jeffrey, I want to uh, switch gears here a little bit to commodities. Um, where does it fit in this, you know, this new age or this new world we're looking at, the transition from this ultra-aggressive Fed to maybe one that's got to blink at some point? Is the notion of a super cycle, a commodity super cycle still out there? 
I think so, uh, particularly because I believe there's a lot of downside room on the dollar. When it comes to commodities, I look at the Bloomberg Commodity Index, BCOM, and it, it's been living below its 200-day moving average for a while now after going up quite substantially in the first few months of 2022. And I am not involved really in commodities other than gold at this point, which I also think will do well when the dollar goes down. But with the economy weakening, uh, it's difficult for commodities to really uh, get get going on the upside. I really think you need easier monetary mm-hmm. policy for that to happen. So I'd, I'd wait for the, the, the BCOM to cross above its 200-day uh, moving average and, and stay there for like a week or something like that. And then I think you could, might see another leg up in commodities as the dollar declines. But now I'm on the sideline broadly on the commodity complex. And just look at uh, WTI, which is a really important commodity. And that's been going, uh, it's been hanging out there at about 80 for quite some time. So I want to see that start to move on the upside as well. I want to pick up on the gold uh, for a minute because gold's acting great. The chart looks phenomenal. Last year, the central banks that weren't the uh, Federal Reserve, and maybe not the ECB, but all these other global central banks bought as much gold as possible. Uh, you know, what is, what's, is there something, what's going on that's sparking this particular move? I just think it's global uncertainty and also the dollar going down again. I mean, the dollar's been really important relative to the gold price. So in most, com- in most currencies last year, gold did quite well uh, because right. it was pretty stable. It was up 2% in dollar terms, but the dollar uh, index w- was up a lot. So in foreign currencies, you did pretty well in gold. Uh, but I-, I just think that sort of mistrust of uh, the geopolitical situation will likely uh, also be a tailwind for gold in addition to a, a, a easier Fed policy and a declining dollar. Jeff, uh, you know, you've got uh, a presence outside of the financial arena, and from time to time you comment on issues outside the markets. Late last year you made a post, a Twitter post, and you were asking President Biden to, to quote, please get tough on fentanyl now. Uh, I know you've got a blue-collar background, and I believe, I feel like you are more grounded than other Wall Street titans, for lack of a better term, with respect to where the country is heading right now. What are your thoughts about that? I just find it appalling that we wring our hands over you know, tragedies that occur because there's shootings of six or eight or 15 people, and that's horrible, and it gets a lot of play uh, in, the, in the mainstream media. But people are dying of fentanyl by very large numbers every single day. Um, I don't know if it's 200 a day or 300, but it's, it's, one, it's somewhere in that range per day. And we know that it's coming through Mexico, the Mexican border. We know that it's coming out of China. And yet we don't do anything about it. And I just find I, I, it, I just have to scratch my head and ask the question, why are we allowing all of these deaths due specifically to this fentanyl? And now, of course, they make it look like candy even right. to try to make it more appealing to children. Yeah. Why don't we stop it? And uh, the only answer to that question that, that I can come up with is because we don't want to. And that's an appalling answer because we're having we're allowing all of these deaths. You know, when we had COVID deaths, that was a big tragedy. But a lot of those were comorbidities. A lot of deaths were probably just accelerated. You know, people dying of cancer and then the COVID did them in. It gets chalked up as a COVID death. These fentanyl deaths are 100 percent purely due to this illegal uh, activity with this incredibly highly toxic substance coming in. I'm sure there's enough fentanyl in the United States to kill all of us five times over. I mean, you, you, you've seen the videos, these yeah. police officers, all they have to do is get near the trunk of a car that's got fentanyl in it, and they've got to get e-penned or whatever you call it there with, to, to bring them back yeah. from the OD. So I just wish that we really cared about really some very substantial problems instead of uh, focusing always on multi-trillion dollar, you know, spending bills that nobody reads. Yeah. And we well, just had another one of those get floated up. I just want to say, is when someone of your level putting, uh, you know, using your platform and your voice will help because everyone in America is asking the same question. And hey, we've run out of time, Jeff, but I do also want to point out that you began the webcast uh, acknowledging that you had a real tough year last year. And I just think that humility is so important for everyone watching. The market's going to humble you from time to time. And they hear someone like you to say, hey, you know, it was tough. It was tough for me. Let's regroup and let's make it back. It means a lot. It also means a lot that you did the show today. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, Charles. It was a tough year for everybody. It actually turned into a dumpster fire by the middle of the year. Thank- thankfully, we've-, we've got out of that disastrous period. And now real rates aren't rising anymore, so we've less of a headwind yeah. for risky assets. So that- I think that's one of the reasons we've had a rally 
to start this year. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks, Appreciate Charles. you. The Bond King, folks. All right.